Morning all. Let's continue our look at amazing sacrifices and this time those sacrifices of Anatoly Karpov. Anatoly Karpov has been known to have a boa constrictor style of chess. Uh, this is highly contrasting to Kasparov who's like a tiger which pounces. A boa, strict, a boa constrictor, as its name implies, constricts, restricts and so he's often taking control of the whole board, restricting the opponent's count counterplay, suffocating them in fact, uh, you know, until he, he wins. So some of the sacrifices actually demonstrate that kind of stylistic agenda. Anatoly Karpov has actually got a, a PhD in economics. He's a Russian chess grandmaster and former world champion. He's the official world champion from 1975 to 1985 when he was defeated by Garry Kasparov. He played three matches against Kasparov for the title from 1986 to 1990, becoming uh, FIDE world champion once again after Kasparov broke away from FIDE in 1993. He held the title until 1999 when he resigned his title in protest against FIDE's new world championship rules. For his decades-long standing among the world's elite, Karpov is considered to be one of the greatest players of all time. His tournament successes include over 160 first place finishes. He had a peak ELO rating of 2780 and his 90 months at world number one is second all time behind only Garry Kasparov since the inception of the FIDE ranking list in 1970. So I've got a selection of 16 sacrifices which show how great he was tactically especially when provoked. Um, now here against Topolov, he just played knight c5. So let's put on the kibitza throughout this. And Topolov is really compelled uh, to take uh, this knight. If he moves back, he's going to drop c6. Uh, so he takes that. Queen takes d7. So there's already problems, chronic problems, in Topolov's position here. This this light square bishop is really powerful. Topolov uh, plays rook c8. And now, can you guess what Karpov played? Uh, I'll give you five seconds to pause the video now. Okay, rook takes e6. The whole pawn chain is, is wrecked after this with this rook sacrifice. Uh, it's not taken here. Um, instead, rook a7 is played. Let's have a look at the game continuation. Rook a7. It seems good. And now Karpov continues wrecking this pawn chain with rook takes g6. So fg, queen e6 check, king g7, bishop takes c6. So black's king safety has been significantly reduced. And it's basically an exchange sack to, to also get access to a lot of the light squares. You see these light squares are still weak, say bishop d5 next, or f5. These pawns are also going to be dangerous. So let's see how the game evolved uh, from here. Rook d8. Uh, so black didn't even bother trying to take on c4. If he takes on c4, I think there's big trouble, I suspect. Bishop e4, in fact, it's big trouble. Same bishop f6, queen g4. You can see the light squares have been shattered around black's king. So anyway, so rook d8 was played. C takes bishop f6. Topov is trying to get some active pieces and safeguard his king. Knight e4, bishop d4. Bishop b takes a6, casually taking a pawn over here. So there's actually a threat now of bishop b7, just strangulating uh, the rook over there, like a bow constrictor. Queen b6. Uh, if the rook had dead, take then the seventh rank, of course. We just played check here. This is good. And actually in this position, bishop d7, the bishop and queen work wonderfully on the light and dark squares here. Uh, so there's a very strong attack still. So Topolov, yeah, he's in trouble. He plays queen b6, rook d1, queen takes a6. And now, um, you know, dominating the whole position requires sometimes both color complexes to be under control. So what's, um, so this, this next move gets more control over these dark squares where rook takes d4. So two exchanges down technically but white dominates the position. He, he dominates potentially both color complexes and black's king safety is even weaker now. 
Uh, it's on its last legs after that exchange sack. Check takes the last reign of pawn gone as well. Check queen e5 check knight f6 check bishop e8 check. They're all coordinating and now winning another pawn. So black is pawnless now. <laughs> no pawns at all. Queen d6. Which, which actually gives up that rook on a7, you might have noticed. But what else? Um, if king g7, queen takes d4. So yeah, this, this is pretty nasty. Uh, this was approaching move 40, move 35, so maybe top of um, was low on time as well. So he's, he's yep, he's lost now basically. Uh, queen takes f6. So for the exchange, it's five pawns for the exchange. Bishop h5 stops. Rook d1 check. Rook d2, b3. The queen is safeguarding f2. There's no real attacking points here. After king g2, in fact, uh, Topolov resigned. This game has been um, annotated on the channel actually in more depth if you want to look at it. It's quite a brilliant attacking game from uh, Karpov. But he, you can see the position was very provocative here. White had a massive advantage already uh, before this. Uh, if it just just briefly check if taking immediate, I don't think it really makes a difference here. We still win this exchange like this, and there's still problems for Black. You know his king safety has been uh, compromised. Uh, e7 needs to be moved. Say say there, then we can just win the exchange. So rook a7 has some things going for it, but it still didn't help. Okay, let's go on to another example of Karpov's sacrificial. Moments. So against Victor Korshnoi, uh, Victor Korshnoi has been very provocative in this game. Actually, it's from a Sicilian dragon, and sometimes you, you wouldn't think the Sicilian dragon, especially after Fisher wrecked the dragon so many times, would be used in really important matches. But here, you know, Korshnoi was playing the Sicilian dragon, and you know it's very very sharp. Uh, though uh, now Korshnoi played rook four to c five, uh, which seems to prevent g five. And Karpov actually earlier had innovated with this rook d3 move, safeguarding c3, so making it kind of pointless for black to sacrifice the exchange. And giving white uh, more time for his own attack here. Can you see what white plays in this position to further the attack? It seems as though g5 is prevented here. So what, what would you play? Um, or would you play g5? If I give you five seconds to pause the video starting from now. Okay, Karpov plays g5 anyway. Even though this rook had just retreated, stop it. We have rook takes g5. Now, a beautiful move. Well, from Karpov's perspective, not so much from Korshnoi's. So, what did White play here? And the engine really likes this move. It's really a uh, very strong move here. Okay, rook d5, yeah. So, hitting. Rook and Queen. Now, if Knight takes, then it's just the mate on the H file. <clears throat> so, um, Rook takes was played. Now we have Knight takes. So again, this Knight can't move. Uh, Rook e8 was played. And now a very, very strong continuation actually here. Uh, I'll rule out the obvious one for you. If taking here, this doesn't really promise much except for black being better here actually in this position. No. White plays a really uh, strong move uh, in this position after rook e8. Very 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 powerful stuff. The engine loves this move. And let's look at why. So if I give you five seconds to pause the video starting from now. Okay, no, it's not defending a two pawn. Uh, knight e f four. Okay, and you might think, what, what is what is going on here? Right. Well, white is now threatening. Knight takes followed by knight d five. Actually, knight d five would stop the e seven exit square. Uh, so bishop c6 trying to keep control of d5 to be able to capture on d5 if, if that's the case. But now another 
incredibly powerful move. This is just super accurate uh, tactical chess, really. Um, from black, from white, rather. Okay, e5. Let's have a look. What on earth is this doing now? Well, cautionally, um, if he takes, he gets mated. Okay, that's easy. He takes on d5, though. Well, there's e takes. And what's the point here? Well, the point here is actually, uh, let's have a look. You see this e pawn is actually in the way of this rook. This this pawn is actually damaging the functionality of the rook potentially. But on the other hand, the queen's eyeing e1. But anyway, let's carry on with that concept. That uh, now queen takes h7, king f8. But we noticed the queen was on e1. But here, after check, black resigned because after king e7, we take the queen away from e1 with knight takes d5, and then we use that e file with rook e1. So that's why cautionary resigned. He's going to have to give up his queen. So such an accurately played attack <laughs> with knight e f4. If uh, queen takes, then just to demonstrate some other lines. Check, and then we cover the e7 square. It doesn't matter about the check here. It just shows how accurate uh, Karpov was against the dragon. You know, super accuracy required, and he delivered here. But I think part of this game for this match was preparation with this rook d3. So funny enough, you know, you know, f thinking how they seriously they must have both prepared this in the Sicilian dragon lines, which some regard as a fun opening. It's kind of incredible in a way, just just from that perspective. But Kasparov, by the way, himself had used the dragon against Vichy Anand. Uh, occasionally in in key matches, so let's go anyway on to another example. It just shows that's just really accurate combinative play, sacrificial play. Here's another Topolov game. Um, now Topolov playing black played queen e4. Uh, this was in Dos Hermanos, category 16, 1994. And Karpov played a surprising move here. Uh, if I give you five seconds to pause the video starting from now, what would you play? Okay, knight f6, yeah, dragging the king out. Because if takes, then this unfortunately cheeky knight can't be touched after the check, and then we take on f3. So the king's dragged out, because otherwise we've got this fork. And now, double check. So the king's dragged out even further, king hunt. And funny enough, there's no mate. It's not going for the mate here. White goes for material with queen takes e4 check. So for the moment, uh, two pieces down, but he's getting the rook back. And is also uh, now the rook is forking both bishops. So it's just the exchange up here. Topolov played another move there. But after rook c8, now resigned. Um, in fact, you know, rook c7, then bishop a6 are dangerous now. The exchange up, so top of resigned. So a, le a neat little um, combination here, punishing queen e4 quite drastically. That You can see that weakness of the last move from a scientific basis. Almost as if, without a calculation, you can look at the, the opponent's last move and they've created a certain weakness. It's directly pounced in with the knight here, knight f6. <laughs> There's a shortcut to finding amazing moves in particular positions. Um, to be honest, I think that concept is so powerful. You, you, I think the equivalent in programming is your bugs are in your latest code. You know, it's like the latest bit of code, and there's a bug in it with f6. So. But anyway, it's beautiful to see knight f6 on the board, I thought. So here, Jan Timon against Anatoly Karpov. Now, this, this was uh, in Montreal, 1979. Jan Timon just played knight d1 here. So Karpov seems to have quite a dynamic you know, pawn structure, active rook. You sometimes, you know, maybe you'd associate him with solid pawn structures, but here you know, he's on the rampage here. So 1979. Um, what does he do in this position? If I flip the board so we get it from Karpov's perspective, let's do that. So if I give you five seconds, starting from now, back to play, to pause the video. Okay, Karpov is going for the king here. Knight takes h2. He has been provoked. Look at White's pieces. You know, they're just they're not around his king. So let's look at the obvious 
takes, well here, check using the pin. Now here, check, driving the king. Now if if king here, then bishop g4 is mate. So if the king goes back here, then we just strip away all of white's king's safety. It's, it's fairly routine, isn't it, to do this. And then just switch the rook in, rook e4. So that's to be avoided, and white's up for the slaughter. So basically after knight d1, knight takes h2, uh, white tries c5, interesting try, to try and get rid of this mechanism with the queen h4, with this pin on h2. Karpov plays knight takes f1, and it seems as though after c takes d6, what is he doing? He's lost an important attacking bishop. Now in this position, there's only one good move which really, uh, which needed to be calculated. Um, if I give you five seconds starting from now, what would you play with black? Okay, knight takes g3, so leaving the queen, because we've got knight takes e2 here. Uh, so just have a look at that. I mean, white would just be the exchange down there. We've got the two rooks and the bishop after we take that. So fg was taken instead like that. Queen takes d6. So yeah, this is this is bad news. There's a rook for, for two minor pieces. Um, sorry, it's like the exchange up for black here. <laughs> We've got three bits here. One, two, three. No, a rook for two pieces. Pardon me. Uh, but the king has been compromised. Okay, king f2, queen h6. So we've got this attack going on. Check, winning another pawn. So then we've got potentially dangerous pass pawns as well if it gets that far. Queen g2, protecting c6, and also now pinning the bishop for bishop g4, knight b2. But there's also now even better than bishop g4. No, bishop g4 is strong actually. An, an option for, for the pin is bishop a6. So white's on the defensive, knight d3. Now actually that's just taken, king takes. White's king is very exposed here, rook bd8. Uh, so now threatening very horrible things, and like rook takes d4 check is actually on the cards. Bishop f1 was played trying to safeguard things. Off the check, king c3, c5 now is played. So creating an almighty pin after takes queen c6. These pins are really nasty, just intuitively to, to get these pins, these immobilized pieces. King b3, check, king a3, rook e5. And so the king's about to be mated here it seems. Bishop b4, queen b6. And now, yeah, there's no defense at all of this. If, if rook here, then queen a5, for example, is picking up loads of material, more material. So so white resigned in this position. If queen d2, then a5, and if, if the bishop moves, then queen c5 is, is mating. So pretty vicious attack. I think you'll you'll think that this is not exactly bow constrictor type sacrifice. No, you're right. There are occasions, you know, when he's provoked, he just goes straight for the king, go, goes straight for the jugular, and this is it. Knight takes h2. It's a classic example. So, in Canada, 1979, very well calculated, you know, taking here, taking here for this unfortunate configuration being exploited uh, tactically. Um, on on queen c3, by the way, you might think, oh, friend, mate, actually, you can just take here, and it's still better for white this position. Um, we can just take here, yeah, after, for example. So, yeah, an unfortunate position for Timon there, who was one of the greatest uh, grandmasters from the Netherlands, uh, but in the shadow of Karpov a lot of the time. So, here now against Boris Golko, who's actually got a good record against Gary Kasparov. Anatoly Karpov was playing white here, and Golko played b6. Uh, obviously, he was fearing knight c5, so it seems kind of b6 as though black's position can take it, or can it? Um, you know, the almighty pin rears itself here uh, in, in the variations. I wonder if you can spot how, uh, if I give you five seconds to pause the video, 
um, starting from now. Okay, rook takes d7. It's a clever tactic. So if if knight takes, then we just we just take on c6. So the king steps in, into the center. So it looks as though in theory there's a pin here, but the knight's in the way at the moment. So knight takes b6, full king. So that's taken. Now bishop a4, and this this pin has got a lot of um to it because knight e5 is now coming in. So black has to give up that knight really. White's not taking it immediately. Yeah, that's that's uh, an alternative. Although the engine suggests taking it with the bishop might be good as well. So knight takes c6, and you might think, um, okay, this is uh, what is this? The exchange sack again. Four, six, one, two, three, four, five. So only a pawn, um, and the exchange down. One, two, three, four bits. One, two, three, four. But the exchange down to make sure. But he controls all the square, a lot of the squares, not all the squares, a lot of the squares are controlled by white here after knight e5. So white's now, you know, first thing taking here, first thing check. So rook a c8, we have the check anyway, king a7, and now taking another pawn, so two pawns now. And attacking the rook, the rook moves, knight e5. And you know, white enjoys a nice position here, two pawns for the exchange. Uh, knight d5, rook d1, uh, rook f d8, bishop a4. The game carries on a bit. And knight c6 is threatened, but it's uncomfortable for black. Knight e7, knight d7. Uh, so now actually bishop c3 would be nice for that bishop to start dominating the dark squares there. That stops king f1. Bishop takes e3, an attempt at a tactic, but this fails to rook takes d5. This is good for white, this position. Rook c4. Now b4, safeguarding the pieces here. Bishop c3. a5, a3, takes, takes, rook e7, knight e5. So Karpov's three minor pieces are very strong here. The bishop pair. Uh, helps each other on the light and dark squares. The knight is pretty menacing. Check. The game doesn't last too long from here. So rook e4, h3. g4, check. Knight d2. And now it looks as though this d pawn's doomed. Um, so not after, or king d3, the rook will be awkward. So d4 was played here. Uh, is this one little trick? It's not really. It's it's a pretty bad position apparently. Uh, why can't just take this pawn, either with the pawn or the bishop? And here, uh, Boris Galko resigned. I thought I'd just show you the initial. Really, what I wanted to show you was the initial tactical sequence. I thought was quite clever here to get that pin. So when there's an opportunity, Karpov is there pouncing on it. Uh, you know, it's a bit subtle this one with rook d7, knight b6. I thought. I hope you enjoyed that one. That was in Spain, 1996. It was a team final. Uh, okay, so now against Gick. So Avengi Gick had his knight chased at h5. So I wonder if you can guess what White played here. If I give you five seconds to pause the video, starting from now. <laughs> it's what Fisher will play routinely, apparently. Rook takes h5, sack, sack, and then mate. Rook h1, yes, it is pretty dangerous. Check. Uh, king b1, so offering the knight here. Um, is it is it really possible to take the knight? Black took on f3. If he takes the knight, queen takes h5 is pretty bad here, threatening that standard you know mate, mating pattern. Um, not much black can do in this position really. Uh, so. Queen takes f3, trying to stop this h file somehow. Rook takes h5. e6, so an escape pod for the king. If taking, then the king can come up here. g6 ruins that, starts to ruin that. So actually, is this this is actually the engine's top move in the position again? So when it these positions require only move to actually play the attacking side, uh, it seems. Uh, so what is this doing? Okay, so it looks as though rook takes e5 has been introduced. 
but there's also another very very subtle resource which has been introduced in the position and black tries knight takes g6 we see queen takes h7 king f8 and can you see the resource now for white if I give you five seconds to pull the video starting from now okay rook f5 yes disrupting the queen's protection of f7 the bishop wants to mate as well if needed so black gave up the queen here and didn't last too long after this knight f4 uh, trying to like win this rook if the knight moves away from h8 so this this is fairly straightforward for white to win this now the queen against the two pieces so here black resigned let's have a look at that very very accurate pawn sack again just to see the mechanics behind it so basically g6 basically this pawn is is again annoying the rooks the pawns annoy the rooks because the rooks really want natural action as well so by getting rid of the pawn these resources like rook f5 are immediately generated so there's something to bear in mind if you want really great rooks think about sacrificing a pawn it, it seems on the surface mysterious another option for black from the engine point of view is was f takes on the takes here why it's still apparently better off the check rook h7 and taking here if taking here taking here and now in this position why it's threatening taking here to take that one uh, so say check check I think the checks will run out c3 check Bishop c2 and white's better in this position there's still work to do but white's better so in the game it finished you know more quickly because of that rook f5 resource uh, being missed so knight takes g6 was chosen instead yeah so it seems as though Kopov can mop up these dragons with super accurate play these Sicilian dragons now cautionary so here this is a very interesting game cautionary played the French defense and maybe a bit on the provocative side so Kopov would just play bishop e5 cautionary just taken on f2 and and actually he's cautionary is trying for some sort of counter attack offering on a play what seems to be an obvious tactic but it's the continuation which is remarkable here um, now if white takes this then black is cautionary is better here so white's basically forced to go in for well I wonder if you can guess what white goes in for here come off to play if I give you five seconds to start to pause the video now okay Bishop takes g7 now this is very dangerous because the Queen's actually glaring across the second rank here especially c2 and we see this now Queen takes e7 so if white gets another move he'll play this like check for example and then this but it's black's move Bishop f5 threatening mate so this makes things scary but check f6 uh, if it wasn't f6 um, then actually I think Bishop d3 will be okay for white here so f6 after this check so Queen e7 now here I'm not sure Bishop d3 is as good because of Rook h e8 and this, this looks actually from an engine point of view better for black so actually um, here rook there's a rook move rook d2 let's just try it allowing winning the exchange so you might think this is a bit odd okay it's parried the mate threat so this is where the game got really odd but in fact this is this is the better move really this is this is this is the great sacrifice here to sacrifice the exchange basically to bishop e3 and you might think this is this is really crazy stuff I think one of the key things to understand here is that Karpov recognizes that when you get rid of bishops of a certain color you're opening up the colors for your own uh, pieces you're basically getting square control on that color complex rook f1 so he's not only aiming to knock out the bishop but potentially now the light square bishop so the dark square bishop goes after knight takes 
and now the light square bishop goes. So white is trying to get control on the light squares as well for a light square attack. Now in this position, uh, e eight's covered. There's no rook e eight, um, or is there? Let's just just make sure. Uh, for engine check this because I'm just wondering about the checks here. No, we can just take care. It's check anyway. So here, king takes f five. Check. You see, Karpov's got control of the light squares, and attacking with the checks. Check. And now, okay, so two exchanges down. So that's now two exchanges down. But it doesn't really matter because White's got um, Black's king here, and these it's very very precarious. King f5, Queen takes b7, sort of torturing Black, playing with Black. So he's got things like Knight c5 now. King g4, check. And here, cautionary should have really, in, in theory, it seems played King f4 or King f5, and it seems horrible though to have to go into this again. But here, if we have this position, it seems as though this might be okay for Black to just try for a draw like this. But uh, cautionary went for more. He actually took this pawn here, and now Karpov precisely played check. Knight f2 check, and look at that queen. It seems coincidental that it took a pawn on b7 for black's king safety, but in fact, now it swoops back with queen h1. Knight e4 check, and splats queen f3 checkmate. But you see, basically in this game, there's kind of a double exchange sack to get control of, especially the light squares, but you know the dark squares as well. It was potentially a position which was backfiring on c2, but Karpov seemed to take control over it, so minimizing his chance of losing and provoking Kulshnoy to slip up really with the king takes h4. A bit sad for Kulshnoy, he didn't necessarily deserve to, to lose that, that one. Uh, so Leningrad 1971 that game. Okay, this next game was against Eldis Kobo Artiga in the Skopje tournament of 1972. Karpov playing white. Uh, Black had just played <laughs> rook c8. So, yes, white seems to have a wonderful grip on the position. Black's pieces seem a bit congested over here. Lovely protection of e5. For me, you know, this position looks strategically as though Black's pretty paralyzed over here anyway. Um, so what does Karpov do here in this position? If I give you five seconds to pause the video starting from now. Okay, f5, yeah, it just rips open the lines. If you get rid of the pawns, the rooks are better sometimes. G takes, now bishop takes f5. If takes here, then we throw some more pawns away to open up for the bishop. So for example, takes here, rook takes, and there's too too many threats in this position. For example, like this, this is this is going to be mating. So um so yeah, very dangerous position. This is not actually taken knight f eight, black tries to arrange the defences. Queen h six, the rook's gonna come in though for the slaughter. Knight g6, that's taken. The rook still comes in for the slaughter. So rook h3 now threatens. Bishop f8, queen drops back. Bishop g7, rook h3. So still going in. So Morozovic style rooks here on h3. Bishop e8, check. King f8. This is a very good position for white, as you might have gathered. gathered. <laughs> Uh, a lot of things are good here. Queen takes g6 was played, so now threatening this rook h7. There's not much black can do uh, defensively here. Plays f6, and white just crashes through with rook takes f6. To be fair, that the position was grim from from the outset. In the final position here, if here we can take this as a mate in five. Um, so it's going to be mate in five, mate in three now. <laughs> Using the b6 square. 
Um, yeah, it all crashed through, but if you look at White's position, White has a total free hand on the king side, obviously. So f5 just accelerates things. Sometimes after rook c8, f5 just gets the, the rooks and bishops working more effectively. And also gives the queen also, also this fine square as well. Uh, once the knight's there, not the bishop, then the queen pounces in, installs herself for the rook to come in. It's very difficult for black to try and defend this position. Here, you might have thought, instead of knight g6, let's try e takes. Just for a laugh, e6, threatening mate on g7. Rook takes f5, now threatens rook g5, because of that g7. Um, so say knight takes c2, rook g5, then we can crash through like this. If king f8, queen f7, if king h8, I think uh, we can start to bring the other rook in slowly with rook f1. Now threatening rook f5. There's nothing really, <laughs> black's far away from doing anything. Rook g8 is queen h6. Uh, it's just black's pieces are really congested. By this stage in the video, you might be surprised. Karpov, attacking player, he's like playing like Tao. Yes, he's played all sorts of positions. He's won so many tournaments. Especially you know, when he defaulted when as world champion, he proved himself by winning tournament after tournament when, when Fischer defaulted and gave Anatoly Karpov the world champion title. He had something to prove um, after 1975, especially. So um, defaulting as world champion. So uh, yeah, th these, there's a whole spectrum of style in his games. But yeah, this position was just asking for F5 and he played the, the needs of the position just to go for Black's King. So this next example against Boris Spassky is quite fascinating, I, I thought, in, in some respects. Um, Spassky played c5 and Karpov really wants this attacking bishop, yeah? So at the moment c4 is threatened to squash the bishop. So we see this move a4, which has a downside in its own right, although it gives the bishop a reverse uh, parking option after c4. It seems actually that after bishop c6, uh, this is really annoying because uh, it's unfortunate. But maybe this has all been calculated by Karpov uh, because really uh, he wants to exert light and dark square pressure and he does so with this next move which is pretty fantastic and simple at the same time. Uh, if I give you five seconds to pause the video here, what would you play in this position? Okay, a5, inviting the exchange sack, so bishop a4, basically an exchange sack in effect, for queen c1. So you see that both this bishop and this bishop are now really going to have prospects, career prospects in this position. Um, you know, immediately if bishop takes d1, this is better for white, here rook takes d1, because for example, here, um, actually we can go for the knight, the best is actually to go for the knight here technically with queen c2. Um, but you see this bishop is really good, for example. And apparently, you know, this 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 is going to be really good for White. Um, but uh, it, the exchange sack wasn't actually taken here, so the simple response: Rook takes d1. If we look at say Knight c8, just demonstrate more more simply, then Bishop takes h6, and you see that both bishops are really quite good here. Uh, and White threatens things like Bishop g5 with that pin, uh, potentially that diagonal being sensitive. So that would be fine for White. So, um, so yeah, so this position, knight c8, but now bishop takes h6, and it happens now anyway, so that sort of position where both the bishops are really good, after bishop takes, rook takes, appears on the board. And Spassky doesn't last too long here. He actually played knight d6, okay, trying to defend f7 and c4 for a moment. So taking on g7, knocking out key defender. And what you might find surprising here, and counterintuitive, because you might think when you've sacrificed material, you need to try and mate black and keep the queens on. Well, this next move, queen g5, 
actually shows no, it doesn't matter. There's too much pressure to win material here. Uh, if the exchange of queens, knight takes g5, and black's falling to bits here, uh, where does the, where does the knight go without losing um, the other knight? So that's not tolerable. So f6 was played, but queen g4 now threatens rook takes d6 and knight f5 check. So king h7. Now knight h4. You see black's weak on the light squares and uh, even rook d6 is now threatened. In, in this position Spassky resigned. Let's look at some examples of, of why this is so bad. Okay, say rook g8, rook takes d6, knight here and we're actually threatening this checkmate here because the knight's covering g7. So if takes here check we can actually win the queen for example check and take the queen uh, so that's one example it just shows it's pretty hopeless this position uh, <clears throat> so that's on rook g8 if knight f8 in this position knight takes g6 is crushing if takes here rook takes d6 so threatening taking here uh, sorry check here so if here, check, and if here we've always got um, we've got queen g6 and knight f5. So it doesn't really matter. There's a horrible knight fork here. It's all falling to pieces for black. This position after knight h4. So what impressed me, you know, from the original position, it looks as though um, this this whole idea was, um, you know, this, this black's idea. Was was quite good here, and the normal thing you might for if you if you just played after c5, if white had just played this, then Spassky would be absolutely fine in this position. There'd be no problems. Uh, we're getting to get rid of this uh, light square bishop, so it's actually you know preservation of a very important attacking light square bishop for an exchange sack. The exchange sack has importance in that it's maintaining basically the light square pressure in the position. To offer the exchange like this, it seems ridiculous, but this is a great combination to just offer this skewer on a plate for black. Uh, both the bishops just just become revitalized pretty pretty short shortly after this. Um, yeah, what amazing stuff! I mean, it's nice to chip away at that h6 pawn, of course, as well as an immediate reward for the exchange sack, and then c4 is weak, and then diagonals weak. It just crumbled pretty quickly for Spassky. So that was uh, 1973. Now this next one against Miguel Quinteros, a legend in his own right. This is played in Leningrad, 1973. Quinteros playing black. Doesn't look that pleasant with the knight on d6. And white's threatening to win the light square bishop. So what does black do, in fact? Uh, the engine suggests taking might be the best here uh, to allow that rook d6, the lesser evil. But uh, bishop d5 was played. Can you see what Karpov played in this position? If I give you five seconds to pause the video, starting from now. <clears throat> okay, rook takes d5. Yeah, if we can move this pawn, we're wrenching open this diagonal. E tanks, but also knight f5 is immediately threatening. Knight e7 check. Knight takes e7. Queen steps out of the way and protects the bishop. Okay, well, what have we got? We've got extra light square control back here through the exchange sack. We've got this light square bishop, which is going to be really dangerous. Queen g4, g6. Knight takes h6 check. King g7. Check, King H8, and here Karpov calmly <laughs> played this next move is amazing. So what happens here? Um, he could actually White's position is so strong he could actually just retreat the knight. He just keeps it installed there with Bishop D3. Black dare not take. So he's starting to dominate the position, suffocate Black actually with this move, because if we consider taking, it's it's pretty fatal here. Black dare take this. There's nothing. To be done here. We can just if we try and protect like this. Then bishop e5 pinning 
and it's going to be it's going to be a forced mate. So <laughs> the knight has to be tolerated basically. And Black's playing rook g8 now, and he's getting slowly squashed into a pulp here. Knight h6. The boa constrictor at work. H5. Queen e8. E6. So Black dare not take that because this looks pretty gruesome. Hg opening up the rook against the king. Knight d f6. E takes f7. Black dare not take this because it's taking the queen check and then taking back here. Uh, so queen d8. Now just queen d4, just sitting on the position. Uh, this is chess's torture or something. What what is this? <laughs> is it? So there's no immediate mate. It's just Black so tied up. All these pins. Look at the bishops. They're really quite amazing. So black played knight takes h5. Okay, getting some material here, trying to get some relief. Now white doesn't try and smash through. He just exerts more pressure. Bishop e5. Bishop f6. Rook e1. So taking away basically um, now black's dark square bishop. Uh, he wants to take away Black's dark square bishop, so bishop takes e5, rook takes e5. Uh, so there's a threat now of taking here. So we've got double check stuff going on now with the queen pointing at the king, basically. Knight five to f6. Now calmly, Karpov plays g4. Black really can't do much here. This is really an unpleasant, gruesome position uh, to be in. Queen f8 was played. If Black tries to stop g5 with g5 himself, uh, White can take here, and this is horrible. And then, actually, in this position, Rook e8. If the Knight takes, um, we can either Queen or there's a forced mate in four with check, and <laughs> and and the quickest mate is actually Queening a Knight here. Funny enough. Pressing Queen H3. Ah oh dear, ah oh dear. Um, so yeah. <laughs> so let's go back. These fun variations. Yeah, if Black played G5, but yeah, Black didn't play G5. Black played Queen F8, G5, Knight E4. White just takes this after D takes. Queen takes E4. Black resigned. Black had enough. Yeah. This is a slight example of constriction. You see these pieces huddled here, white controlling the central squares as we're told to do when we start chess. Um, white's now threatening all sorts of things, including queen takes a8 and rookie eight check. Okay, so black really uh, has a bad time here. If he plays rook b8, rook e8 is is pretty nasty. So say taking here queen e7. This pawn has got a loss to expand here after taking, taking. Uh, this is all falling to bits for black. So yeah, pretty brutal stuff in this game. So bishop d5 punished cruelly. The engine really likes this move. Rook takes d5. So it gets that f5 square to start off with. Uh, it seems to give black this queen e8, but queen g4. It's just pretty nasty from here. Pressing mate, winning that h6 pawn, and just building up and up here until Black's really squashed into a corner there. E6, opening up that diagonal, and then the Queen eventually sits on that diagonal, basically ready to pin these pieces. And you might think, well, taking here was that potential for slip up? It doesn't. If it doesn't do anything concretely, it doesn't actually do anything concretely. Why do that? So the way Karpov played it is just cool as a cucumber. He really wants to get rid of Black's dark square bishop, and after that, Black is um, more helpless. In fact, in this position for g4, for this g4, g5, White's celebrating the diagonal. If we look at this in slow motion here, it's and also the pieces are just visibly just stuffed into the corner. Um, okay, so after Queen takes e4, yeah, Ingo Quintross had had enough. Now this next example um, is Anatoly Kov against John Nunn. Nunn played some kind of Sveshnikov in this game since Sveshnikov was weak on the light squares. And this pattern actually, I think, is one of 
two or three times maybe Carpal playing white against non in Sicilians where white has greater light square control. But here Carpal will really follow up with a G4 plan to open up this G5 so he's actually uh, compromising black's king safety. John Nunn played queen c3 and here Karpov, um plays an interesting move so it seems b4 might be an issue. What does Karpov play in this position if I give you five seconds starting from now? Okay rook g3 he doesn't mind the exchange of queens here. Uh, white's better here and might be playing f5 soon um, and bishop e6 and then rook takes e4 so slowly dominating the position. Uh, there's a statement by Karl sometimes he says given the choice of something unclear or an end game with microscopic um, chances uh, to win but zero chance to lose he might choose the latter. So I don't think he'd mind this uh, because there's very little chance of white actually losing uh, this position and there's chances of winning. If, For example h6 f5. Let's, let's just give an example bishop e6. We're going to go around this pawn like the boa constrictor so, slowly swallowing its prey uh, live. Um, here actually in this particular position yeah rook takes e4 is okay. So no none doesn't want any of that stuff. He takes on b4 and now we get this doubling of rooks so the pawn sack gives white immense pressure now. Uh, rook g5 means actually queen h3 is introduced as well now queen f6. Rook 1 to g4. I find it quite majestic now king g2 the king is going into greater safety parked on h3 here now. And you might think well, queen c3. In this position it doesn't work. Queen takes and then we're actually mating on g8. <laughs> so yeah that can't be punished. Rook c e7 f5. So slowly squeezing black John Nunn. Rook h5. So the rooks can slowly double. I will try and do a John Nunn sacrifices video at some point soon because I have great respect and admiration for John Nunn. Uh, rook f8. Rook g h4 h6. Rook g4 yeah slowly squeezing on the light squares. Rook g6 now coming in. Rook e5. Slight trap set for rook g6 here. If rook g6 in this position black can take and then take here and that's actually better for black. So in this position Karpov plays rook g g5 taking his time after rook c6. Now making the idea of rook g6 appear again with this next move. I wonder if you can spot it. <laughs> Sorry for the sarcastic joke. It's a nice one. You wouldn't think of this. I um, Ordinarily if I give you five seconds to pause the video starting from now. Okay king g4 it makes rook g6 possible. Yeah, believe it or not, the king seems to be part of the attacking team in this position. Rook h7, rook g6, so there's not no tricks or anything. Queen f8. Now queen g5, fractions taking, and then queen g6, which would be horrible. So here John Nunn had enough of this position. Well he, he has he has he's busted here. If if he plays move right, rook d eight. So let's let's move the rook to a more sensible square. Just to demonstrate, we have this check, and then we have a check here, then we take here, and in fact, this is mate. <laughs> so yeah, John Nunn is forced to like give up peace. So he plays this check, gives up peace because Rook takes G7, White's a bishop up, and was and Black resigned here. So that was a slow positional suffocation, where the sacrifice in the comes of the pawn. Yeah, it's not such a major deal. But um, I thought it was wonderful how Black's uh, defensive resources were kind of squished out of the position, and just h6, g7 under huge scrutiny here. 
with rook takes h6 like this for queen g6 coming in. Yes. Okay, so this next game, so it's not just the top British grandmasters that got it. The top US grandmasters here, Yasser Soen, uh, playing um, white. Yes, so this was on Hamburg TV in 1982. White played rook e3. So what does Karpov do? Um, you might think uh, a sensible move might be queen f5 because you might note here that taking, you can't take the bishop because the knight is, is hanging. Um, and if you took yeah, if you took with the queen, this, this might be okay. But on the other hand, it's okay for white still because the knight's still a problem on the edge. Um, so it needs to be nanny that hasn't got too many squares. And this would justify Yasser Soen's queen on a5. No, instead of this, actually, Karpov uh, calmly sacrifices an entire piece with queen b1. Uh, basically, because his idea is not f takes e, funny enough here. If he plays f takes e, uh, white is is better with e3. Or there might be a perpetual check, you might think actually that there might be a perpetual check here. Um, this this position is also potentially apparently okay for black with, with best play it seems. But no, he, he actually, his idea is not that it's to sacrifice the knight, but first play the check. Um, throws in the check. Bishop takes e6, so he sacrifices that knight. You might think, what is this? Is this a speculative thing? This is not the sort of thing Karpov does. Go for the king here with a speculative piece sack. Well, check, check. And now bishop f5. So threatening check and mate here. Knight e1, defending that c2 square. Now in this position, the rook needs to come in to join the team. Rook b8. So queen takes a7, rook b6, the rook is coming in. e3, rook c6. Bishop c4. Um, okay, so what's going on with bishop c4? What is this resource about? It's quite clever. It interferes with the queen and rook. So if takes, then check is actually apparently this is okay for white because we can snap out that rook, and this apparently is equal uh, depth twenty six anyway. So of stockfish. So bishop c four clever move, but Karpov plays check, check, and here in this particular position. Now plays this, and it's a lot more dangerous than what we just saw of the check. Queen takes c6 because c3 now threatens queen d2 uh, checkmate, and also other things are on the cards which are really dangerous. And white has to resign this. White resign this. If white white's best is for to hold for a mate in four with this, take check. Check and um, Queen C one. Yeah, let's have a look at that nuance here after Bishop C four. So basically, uh, by not taking immediately the check instead, and then the check here in this position to take is a lot better because we got that C three. If if we're taking, um, just to recap on that, if we're taking here the check here takes here. Um, not sure there's any time for this here. Um, the king can actually go to f3 there. So and white's actually much better there. So actually just to celebrate the precision um, and you might think well couldn't couldn't the king have gone to f3 in that position? Here king f3 there's bishop e4 check. And actually, we could still swing the rook as well, or, or take on f2. So yeah, so the way it was played was 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 accurate after bishop c4. Uh, first, ensuring that the king 
is on the back row and the queen's on the seventh rank here. Uh, with that queen on the seventh, that pawn hitting c3 will threaten queen d2. So off, off to offering the rook. Yeah, so that's mating. No, I'm just looking at the mechanics of it, just for our own instructive benefit, if we can try and gleam some insights, which maybe we haven't got from these positions, if you've seen them before. So this next example against Gillis Sachs, uh, Anatoly Karpov was playing white. Again, yeah, this is in the Nara's 1983. Um, after Rook F8. As I say, the exchange sack by Karpov is often to, you know, get control of a whole color complex to, as part of his control of the entire position, as part of the boa constrictor to just dominate the opponent, dominate the position. So here, what would you play with white, which kind of ticks that box, a positional sacrifice? If I give you five seconds to pause the video starting from now. Okay, rook d5, offering an exchange sack here, gets a lot of pressure now on the light squares. In fact, this is hard to justify. Let's let's see if, well, black played rook d8 here, if he just defends like this. Actually, we've got bishop c6 check tactically. That's pretty horrible. For example, like this, if we can just take here, the bishops just dominate the position and black's king safety is, is shot to pieces here. Rook d1 is a concrete threat to deal with. The rooks are just hopeless here. So it's not a good idea to give that position. So rook d8, bishop c4. So bishop b5 check is now really dangerous. After rook d7, yeah, we just use that pin. So this was trying to be stopped with bishop b4, c3. And now a resourceful defense, it seems, b5. Uh, so Karpov has got to be careful. He doesn't want to put the bishop in the firing line of a rook here. I'm not sure this is um, that great. He plays it, um, you know, it might be one of the better moves actually. The engine suggests bishop d5 is plausible. He actually put the bishop on e2, bishop d6, queen d5, so putting pressure on e5 now and b5, king e7. This, this is actually a little mistake here, a uh, major mistake. Apparently Queen C seven might have been okay uh for a moment at least for black. Uh black might be coming in with B four here. Right, if it takes in this position, King E seven, this might be better than the game, better version than the game. Uh but we see in the game, yeah, King E seven being played here, which runs into something horrible actually. If I give you a clue, pin and win, and five seconds to pause the video starting from now, what would you play? Okay, bishop c5. So threatening, queen takes e5, check. Um, now if f6 here, then there's a really vicious tactic in this position, actually, which, which is unfortunate for black. I mean, these loose pieces are often picked up in tactics, like the queen on a5. What would you play in this position? If I give you five seconds to pause the video here. Okay, bishop c4. So we're threatening mate on e6. And if it takes, we win the queen like this. Uh, so this, this would be actually good for white, yeah? Queen and rook against two rooks. So um, basically, f6 is not possible. That's unfortunate. So bishop takes c5. Yeah, losing a center pawn. Queen takes c5. So only the exchange down now for um, how many pawns? Three, four, five, six. Three, four, five, six. So for no pawns, but the exchange down. But the light square bishop now he can take on b5 if he wanted to. But plays check even stronger. Takes the center pawn, so for one pawn now. Check. Now rook e1, the king's so exposed here. Rook d6, trying to arrange a third rank defense. Check. Stopping that rook e6. Taking another pawn. Yes, horrible. The bishop really dominates the light squares. g6, queen f3. And now we see all sorts of fun ideas for white emerging. King c8. 
this was a slight slip up again a weakness of the last move which creates a kind of chess as a science scenario I wonder if you can spot the weakness of the last move here that's exploited by white if I give you five seconds here to pause the video okay not check here because I think this, this is still okay for black but actually rook e7 that's really unfortunate if takes check check and we're kind of winning the queen because if here that's mate so it kind of wins the queen so yeah rook e7 that spells the end of the game really the rook on the seventh it carried on a bit with check here takes takes here still bad check check now if king d8 again we have that mate here so the king has to step into the center check here and black resigned it's a mate in two actually if king e5 queen d4 and then bishop b3 checkmate and you can see actually from a positional point of view that white's controlling the dark and light squares I mean, from from the outset of the combination, it seemed positional to control the light square. So I thought I'd just mention that, although it's technically checkmate as well. But there's control of the position, and why it's got better central control. If you look at the other features, which were triggered off initially from rook d5, it's just to dominate the entire position after rook d5. It's not the kind of exchange sacrifice we'd normally think of, but it does compromise Black's king safety to get rid of that light square bishop, taking out Black's bishop here. So that is against Giller Sachs. Another tournament from the Phillips and Drew tournament. Phillips and Drew later became um, new, part of UBS. Um, uh, actually, so it was an investment bank that sponsored tournaments um, in the 80s. So in 1984, Phillips and Drew, John Timmon uh, playing white here against Karpov. Uh, I think this was from a Scotch game. So Queen E3 was played. So precise moves needed here. There's a tempting check. Uh, would you play this, or would you do something else? I'll give you five seconds to think about the position. So can't have to play with black. Five seconds to pause the video, starting from now rather. Okay. Now the check doesn't actually it allows this escape here. You see, we can always cuddle the king here with king g2 or even queen f3. No, the check is made much more effective with g5, trying to wrench open the f file first. So we can't take as that rook on h1. So bishop takes, and now the check, king f2, and now we've got rook h f8 check. And this is really bad for white. Um Example, if bishop f4, this wasn't played, if bishop f4, rook takes e5, using the pin, the queen moves, where can the queen move? Rook e2 check, it's supported, and that's horrible, we can take the queen there. So basically, um, bishop f4 doesn't seem to do much good here for white. King g2, rook takes e5, was played, oh, wow. Rook sacrifice. It gets control of that f3 square, so check. King h2, check. And Timon resigned here. He's going to be losing his queen after king h3. There'll be bishop c8. If he doesn't, well, if he plays g4, then there's some mate in two. No, he's losing the queen or getting mated, whatever. <laughs> it just lays the mate. So the initial position, g5, really accurate crushing move, preparing that bishop b4 check. And the nice rook sacrifice here uses that f3 square, makes use of that f3 square. Wonderful stuff. Who would have thought? Karpov can play exactly like Tal in the right circumstances. He'll go for the king. Very accurate calculations. Totally sound combination. Very good position. Okay, on to our next example. 
Now, this really impressed me at the time of the 1987 World Championship match between Gary Kasparov and Anatoly Kolmov playing Black Kolmov. Kolmov had the prepared idea here in this variation, bit of a shocker. Can you spot what Kolmov played? White wants to wrench open the F file for F file pressure, and maybe later the bishop's going to be good as well. So Kolmov to play. Can you spot the innovation? If I give you five seconds to pause the video, it's starting from now. Okay, he plays e3. It was a stunning idea of pawn sack uh, at the time, I think. So if um, if takes this, this is okay for black. Just a positional pawn sack d6. Uh, White's got really wrecked uh, structure, and black's looking forward to having a lot of fun torturing the structure. So come off, yeah. This e3. Kasparov played d3, and I found it impressive the game from here. Um, black liberates the position with d5. It seems a free and easy to play position. He's only given up a bishop, dark square bishop, and this dark square bishop doesn't look too good. Queen b3. Knight a5, a forcing move. Queen a3, c6. You might think, what's the point of this? Well, the knight can't be easily attacked here, and black really wants to play h6 and start driving. White back and taking here. C takes d5, c takes f4. The knight returns back. Rook b1, queen c7. Yes, bishop b2, bishop g4. So black has a nice game from this e3, which wasn't accepted. After c4, Kopov took on c4, allowing his structure to be compromised. But he's, he's banking on variations with bishop e2 here. Kasparov took here and played knight e4, king g7. The best move apparently is queen c3. And we, we get a glimpse actually uh, that actually this this isn't so easy actually if queen c3 had been played. Queen d8, uh, white might actually be okay here. Um, there's variations like this with rook takes e4 to, to relieve f6. And queen d2, and this, this should be about equal, apparently. Crazy stuff. It's just in the variations, but uh, in the game, um, it seems this whole f6 opportunity wasn't used at all. Because uh, after rook ad8, uh, now there's no real time uh, for queen c3. Because queen c3 does knight d4 now. We're on e2. So we just you know, take on e2 there. So yeah, rook b3. Maybe Kasparov was shaking his head here, because what is his queen doing here? It looks ridiculous. This pawn is dislocating his position. I thought it was aesthetically one of the more stunning games between them. Knight d4. So offering e3 pawn finally. Queen takes c4. King h1. Knight f5. Rook d3. Bishop takes e2. Rook takes, rook takes. So Kasparov hasn't got too many moves here to play. He moves the rook. Rook e8. Now he has to move the knight or do something else. Okay, he counterattacks the knight to, to respond to that knight being attacked. Now b5. Now the knight moves. Queen d3. It just seems horrible because knight e3 is now on the cards. Knight b3. Bishop f3 going for white's king. If rook takes, then queen f1 is checkmate. So uh, bishop takes f3 was played. Queen takes king g1. Rook takes e1. Queen takes e1. And now after knight e3, Kasparov had to resign. He's faced with this horrible mate on g2. If queen f2, then queen d1 is, is mating. So yeah, this this is a, what appears to me to be an extremely brutal game where Kasparov had this moment where he could have attacked f6, but after that he went totally downhill when he didn't exploit that moment. He was just uh, his king was kind of butchered from starting from this dislocated, dislocating pawn on e3, which was was later taken, but 
E3 then was available for a black piece if we look at this. <laughs> Horrible. It was actually the square which won cop off the game with knight e3 yeah, at the end. So that was in the Sevilla match 1987. Now this next example, the final example, might do another cop off video soon. <laughs> it's it's really quite revealing. Uh, bishop d7. So you want to take control of the whole position starting with the dark squares here, that's the clue. So what would you play here if I give you five seconds to pause to pause the video if you want to think about it. White to play against Vladimir Melaniuk. This was in nineteen eighty eight. Okay, rook takes e seven. Engine lights it. Bishop takes rook takes. So exchange for a pawn, already good investment opportunity. Now if rook if this rook, for example, here this wasn't played, then bishop takes d6. This is fine. We got two pawns. Um and we're we're mating black's king or winning the queen. Uh so that's that's pretty nasty. So it's you can, already there's a little bit of evidence this whole dark square against black's king is horrible. So rook f six there. It's, apparently this is one of the top moves from an engine point of view to play in the position. Uh white is threatening already d5 but you know what to do if d5 here then bishop d6 we're coming into this diagonal anyway so rook f6 was played d5 so we're wrenching open this diagonal queen f6 queen f8 rather rook e3 king g8 bishop b2 now not to be content with dark squares the bow constrictor needs white squares as well so rook f5, queen d4, rook e5. Uh, this is just taken. Queen takes e5, king f7. So we need light squares. d6 introduces an important resource. Bishop d5 into the position at, at the right moment. Bishop f5, c5 introduces bishop f1 for the bishop to come like this. <laughs> Danger time. H five. Bishop F one's good here, by the way, in this position. Uh, also good, even better might be G four. H G H G. So if the bishop goes to E six, then this is a mating free. Just check we're winning that bishop anyway. So the bishop goes to D three. So Bishop F one has been extinguished, but we have. I hope you can spot it. Five seconds to pause the video. Okay, Bishop D five, and Black resigned. Yeah, technically Black's getting mated, but also if you look positionally, White is controlling <laughs> the light and dark squares and the center. That's a trademark of the final positions of Karpov. He's not just mating the opponents; he's got good central control and grip on both color complexes. Uh, if you've got the light squares and the white squares, you've got quite a lot of colors covers. Have <laughs> the theoretical colors, so yeah. Um, bishop d5 shows total domination in the position. So all starting from this, uh, rook takes e7. So the idea is not a forced mate or anything. It's domination of of the position with rook takes e7. Dark squares, then light squares will actually mate the black king as a consequence of that. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this little tour. Um, comments or questions on YouTube. Thanks very much.